Hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome to Beyond Employment. With me, the company's expert, again, here for episode number four of Beyond Employment, where the tagline was how to break away from the corporate world and leave your, or, sorry, okay, I screwed up the tagline. That's always a good sign. How to break away from the corporate world and have your own business or startup. Uh, there's going to be five of these. This is the fourth one. And I want to welcome everybody here. If there is anyone here or you're watching this on the replay, because it's very, very late, very, very late at night that I'm doing these just as an experiment. There are nine people here. Congratulations. Thank you for being here. You guys are awesome. If you are looking to do something more in this life to make money than simply working as an employee or working a string of jobs as opposed to a career, uh, you want something more. There is more out there, but it requires learning. And uh, it requires learning about stuff that not a lot of people are talking about. So that's why I wanted to do uh, this series of live streams, because I know people are interested in learning this, but I don't know. It's, it's hard to sell people on this idea because they don't really know what good information is when they hear it. At least that's my impression. Um, you know, a lot of people, they want to hear very inspirational things but without a lot of substance, not a lot of what to do, you know, and how to do it. So uh, that's why I'm trying to do this. I love to talk about this stuff, and thank you for joining me. Um, before we get started, on the topic of inspiration, if you are looking to do something, um, every once in a while, they make really cool entrepreneurial type movies. There's, you know, they make the story, the success story of a famous entrepreneur into a movie. And a lot of them, you know, they're, they're a little bit thin on business lessons, but they're very, very big on inspiration. So if you're looking for something like that, something I just found the other day, there is a great channel on YouTube called History Buffs, where they talk about um, how realistic movies and things are to history. And um, there's a review of the movie the founder, which is, uh, if you haven't seen it, it's the story of Ray Kroc, who famously, um, was the central figure in the rise of McDonald's, you know, the burger joint where you get to buy a big Mac and fries and all that. Um, so they made a movie of that a few years ago and history buffs just did a video sort of, uh, contrasting what's real in the movie and what was a fabrication and what actually happened in real life. So if you are interested in that, you're looking for some inspirational type stuff. Uh, I put the link below in the description box and you can check that out. I recommend that channel. That's a great channel. Um, now, as always with these types of movies, once again, you got to take it with a grain of salt because the stories that they choose to tell, especially in like a Hollywood movie, it's, it's a wild exception, right? They, they will tell the story of Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, you know, uh, you know, how often do you get a Steve Jobs like story? Not very often, right? Uh, we all know how, how often that happens. So when it comes to extracting business lessons from these sort of things, uh, you really have to be careful and you really have to take it with a grain of salt, but it's great at giving you a sort of, um, you know, a, a real life story for the most part where you can see what's possible, right? What types of things are possible. Okay. Now I don't think everyone should aspire to be the next Steve jobs or Bill Gates or, uh, Jeff Bezos or, Ray Kroc, you know, I, I think most people are, uh, in my opinion, would be happy with a realistic plan where you can be, uh, wealthy. You don't have to be a billionaire, but you can, you can be independently wealthy. You can replace any income you would get from a job and, uh, and maybe a little bit more on top. And, uh, you do it while doing something that is your creative child, <laughs> you know, you get to do something your way on your own terms, the way you want it done based on your own strengths. And that can not only replace uh, the income you'd get from working as an employee, but it would uh, allow you to prosper and make more on top of that. So I think 
that should be an aspiration for a lot of people. It's something that's realistic. It's something that this kind of thing is achievable and it happens to people every day. It's not some wild exception that only happens once every 10 years to someone in the world. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, the odds are in your favor. They're more in your favor. Okay. So, so that's something that, um, uh, I think a lot of people should, uh, in my opinion, just life lesson for me. Don't be thinking of a Steve Jobs. Think of something that's a lot more realistic. It's like, uh, it's like planning to win the jackpot in the casino. I mean, yes, it does happen, but most people's typical experience is not successful if they, if they take that strategy, you know, so, so there you go. Um, okay. So we've talked about a lot of things in this stream of podcasts in the first three episodes we talked about the type of people that would want to be an entrepreneur we talked about how these things usually work in the real world you've got uh, employees down here people who work uh for someone else essentially okay they do what they're told in exchange for money uh then you have sort of a little bit higher level on the hierarchy is you have business owners or entrepreneurs people that are at the helm of a business venture, okay, they're the ones making the decisions, they're the ones calling the shots, they're the ones taking the risk, and they're the ones reaping all the rewards, okay? So you have those people in the middle. And then at the very top, you have people that have gone beyond that, they're not, they're no longer working at a business unit level, and instead they become essentially investors, okay? Whichever way you slice it, uh, they are investors, okay? Maybe you own multiple businesses, uh, you know, or, or you don't even own the businesses at all. You're just buying and selling shares or, you know, you, you have a holding company, something like that. Okay. So that's kind of up here. Now we're going to, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the thing in the middle. Okay. Which is a step up from working as an employee. And that's what this is about. Now, uh, I wanted to start off today, tonight with something a bit more tangible. Okay. Uh, there are three common business strategies. And maybe you've heard of these. They're they're very proliferated very uh, a lot on the internet. Um, a, a, a God, <laughs> it's late. I have to uh, I have to look at my notes. I'm also very very sick at the moment, and I've medicated myself so I can so I can do this. Um, but three basic strategies that everybody talks about, and I feel a lot of people. Uh, it's so basic that it is talked about in very amateur entrepreneur circles. Okay. Cost leadership, differentiation, and focus. Those are probably the three most famous business strategies. They're the three most basic. Uh, let's talk about them tonight and for the purposes of dispelling some misinformation about it. Okay. Cost leadership. You may have heard about this. Okay. Um, if you're going to set up a business, okay, maybe you're going to have your own store or booth, you know, at the very bottom end. Something like this, okay? Um, let's say you have a family business. You know, I'm trying to pick something that's very, very basic here. Um, what is going to lead to prosperity, to profitability, to long-term profits and long-term sustainability and long-term growth? What is going to do that? Now, what I see a lot of people who don't really know business, but you know, they have a family business or they have something. A lot of people take this strategy and run with it. That's the cost leadership strategy. Okay. Now what this says is that the focus of your business is going to be on reducing your costs as much as you possibly can. And the purpose for that is so that you can set your prices as low as possible. And the goal would be to have the lowest prices for a given product or service. Okay. It's very simple. Um, now a lot of people hear this and I think also instinctively they think that, Oh, you know, this is, that sounds like the way to go. The problem is, is that, uh, what I don't really hear a lot of people saying and what they don't tell you is that this strategy only really works for two people for extremely large businesses. Okay. Because they take advantage of something called economies of scale. Maybe, maybe you know what that is. Maybe you don't economies of scale is that, you know, when you make something in large quantities or do something in large quantities, you become very efficient at it. 
So that allows you to lower the costs of your, uh, your operations basically. Okay. So if you're making a product, let's say you're building, um, I don't know, pianos. There we go. There's some pianos used to be popular. Now you don't really see them in homes, but anyway, uh, let's say you're in the business of building pianos. You have one company that builds and sells say 10,000 pianos a year. And then you have another company that builds and sells two pianos a year. Okay. Now the way that works, all things being equal is that the big company, their cost of producing one piano will be actually quite low because they do it very efficiently. They have a lot of practice at it. They're buying materials and things in quantities. So you get like large quantity discounts and things like this. So their cost of building a piano is very low. If you're only building two pianos a year, chances are you're not using things like automation. Uh, you're not purchasing your materials in large quantities. And therefore it's much more expensive for you to build one piano. And let's say for the sake of argument that these pianos from the two different companies, they're identical. Okay. Um, so the small company doesn't have the economies of scale. So therefore the big company will always be able to beat the small company when it comes to this strategy. Okay. Cost leadership because the costs of the big company are always lower. You can't lower your prices down beneath what your costs are. Okay. You have to make a profit. You have to cover your costs and then make a profit on top of it. So getting your costs down is what the game is about. And economies of scale are the biggest factor. So why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because I see a lot of people starting up businesses and their plan and their whole strategy is based on, I'm going to do this cheaper than anyone else. I'm not going to do some radical new thing. I'm going to do like the same thing that everyone's familiar with, but I'm going to do it cheaper right now. You have two choices. Either you could produce something crappier. Okay. The quality is inferior, you know, because you're, you're using uh, lower quality materials than the competing product, which is not good because first of all, it's harder and harder to get and retain customers. And then you also have a lot of added costs because people don't like it. People have issues. You have warranty costs. You have customer complaints, you have returns, you have defects, you have all kinds of hidden costs there. Okay. So that alone sinks you in terms of trying to get your costs down. Um, and also you're making less profit, right? You, you can't make a profit. So, so it's just, it's just not the strategy that tends to work, uh, when it comes to entrepreneurial type ventures. Okay. So people need to look elsewhere when they come to thinking about how they're going to make money at their own little business or side hustle. Okay. A cost leadership strategy, all things being equal, like in 99% of cases doesn't work. Okay. So that's the first point I want to make, but that's the most often talked about strategy. When people talk about entrepreneurship, certainly online and certainly to conferences and things I've been to, uh, you know, that seems to be what everybody's thinking about. And it's also what I see. Uh, I work in a, uh, in a country where you have a lot of immigrants and that's cool. And, uh, I've taught a lot of students and things in the past. And, you know, the students that want to start up businesses, they always sort of gravitate to that in my experience. I don't know if my experience is representative, but they always seem to do this. They're going to, we're going to do this, but we're going to do it cheaper. And it's like, uh, you know, okay, well, if I can't persuade you all the more power to you, but yeah, it doesn't really work. So Moving on. Okay. Moving on from there. We got two more strategies to go. The next one is differentiation. Okay. You might've heard of this, the differentiation strategy. People like to talk about this, like, you know, it's this extremely complex and advanced idea. It isn't, it's actually pretty damn simple. It's that whatever you do, a product or service, it's different in some way to what's already out there. Okay. So, um, you want to make a piano? Okay. Well, your piano is bright red. It's a concert piano for your home or for your symphony orchestra or whatever, but yours is bright neon sparkly red. Okay. Like, like some Ruby slippers. Nobody makes a piano like that. 
If you want to, if you, if you want to have maybe somewhere in the world, they have a ghetto fabulous symphony orchestra that, you know, is looking for something like this. They get it from you because nobody else offers that type of product. Okay. Your product is different. So even if you only made two pianos a year, you like that two, right? Or one, if you only made uh, two pianos a year and they were a little bit more expensive, it might be okay because you've captured the market for you know symphony orchestras or just individuals that want a little more bling in their classical music okay so that might be a thing and hey you might tap this huge you know market that nobody knew was there okay you'll have to excuse me a little i have i am sweating for some reason must be the fever anyway okay and finally finally thirdly we get to the focus strategy that's the third and final strategy that everybody always talks about of all these basic strategies focus strategy okay now this is the one you should probably pay attention to because this is the thing that tends to work it also allows small companies or startup companies that don't have economies of scale that don't have a large customer base to be able to come in and compete okay the focus strategy what you do here is you focus on a particular subset of customers okay so for example let's let's think of a big company um walmart okay i don't know walmart they serve many different types of customer right uh if you're looking for clothes you could go to walmart and you get them for cheap okay um if you're looking for i mean what else do they sell they sell like hardware you want to buy a hammer or a drill, you know, tools, you go to Walmart, they have that stuff, right? Uh, you want to buy a greeting card, you know, happy birthday, you know, you're 150, you go to Walmart, right? So they serve many different types of customers. The, the customer who's going in there to buy a drill is not likely to buy a drill and a greeting card, right? You know, and a sort of crop top fishnet sweater right um i mean you never know there's there's all kinds but uh so so there there's different market segments that walmart is c catering to okay to if, if you're not familiar with that that's kind of a marketing term like think of it think of it in terms of probably the most basic terms you've got say old people middle-aged people and young people right uh, the old person will probably go in there and buy themselves a nice, sensible brown sweater, right? For cheap. Uh, the middle-aged person might go in there and buy themselves a hammer for their house so they can hammer their thumb or whatever, trying to put up a fence. And then the young person might go and I don't know if they'd buy a greeting card, but you know, they buy whatever young people buy a new iPod. Anyway, iPad. Hey, I'm not young, so I'm just making this up as I go. So you've got three different groups there. Now, the old people are not going to buy the same products that the young person is going to buy and vice versa, right? These are all separate groups. Walmart is trying to cater to all of them at the same time. Okay, now, even though there's three different types of customer, when Walmart tries to sell them stuff, they some things are going to have to be common. For example, they all walk into the same store. Let's pretend that Walmart decides that in order to keep the young people in the store, we have to, we have to jazz things up a bit. Okay. We're going to put some really bright lights. We're going to put a lot of, uh, you know, superhero cutouts and like Iron Man and all this kind of stuff in the store. Right. So that helps keep the young people there or something. Okay, whatever young people are into, that's what they do, okay? But that at the same time might not really serve the old people. The old people, they want to come in. I don't know what old people want. They want, they want to go to a counter where they can compl complain to another old person. I don't know. But when they walk in and they see lots of lights and music and, and there's black lights and there's, you know, whatever going on and superheroes and like, that's kind of a turnoff if you're, you know, 110, right? You're not going to want to go in there and, and, and shop for all your stuff, right? So my point is that Walmart can try to serve all these 
different little markets, okay? These little uh, market segments, niche markets or niche. I'm in Canada, so I say niche. If you're in the US, you say niche, riches and niches. Okay, Walmart's trying to serve all these people, but because they have to make a common experience and have it all in one store, it's not really ideal for any one of them. That's the problem. Okay. Would you go to Walmart for all your clothing needs? You know, maybe you're on a budget, need to buy everyday clothes, you go to Walmart. But let's say, I don't know, there's a special occasion, like a wedding or something, you got to buy a suit. Would you go to Walmart for your suit? Probably not. You'd probably go to a suit place, right? So Walmart doesn't serve you, doesn't take care of all your needs for any particular group. So that's where we come back to this, the focus strategy. What you do in the focus strategy is you pick a particular group, a particular niche market, okay, a subset of the, the bigger market, let's say young people, okay, and you cater to them. All you care about is satisfying them. You don't care what old people want. You don't care about what middle-aged people want. All you care about is young people, and you're out to provide the best experience for young people. So if you're a young customer, you might say, you know what, I like this other place more than Walmart because it caters to me. Okay, in order to get to whatever I care about as a young person, when I walk into the store, you know, like, I don't know, let's say the latest technology, electronics, iPad, whatever. In order to get to that, I don't have to walk past a bunch of counters that sell golf clubs and sweaters and, you know, the caps that people used to wear in 1920. I don't have to worry about that. Okay. This store is about me. So that's what the focus strategy is. You pick a market segment and you satisfy them. And because you're only focusing on them, you can actually do a better job than a huge company who's trying to be everything to everyone. Okay. That's the focus strategy. And this works for small companies. Okay. Let me, let me give you another mundane example. I'm going to try and make up off the top of my head. Um, <clears throat> let's say, uh, you had a kid and they were, here we go again. We're going to the, uh, lawn mowing company. If you had a kid at, at a son who wanted to make some money and they were a bit entrepreneurial, you could say, okay, you know, we all live in houses in a neighborhood. Everybody has grass on their property and they all need it mowed. Okay. Well, there are companies out there that will, you know, come and do lawn care and stuff like this. Okay. They'll fertilize your lawn. They'll drive up this big truck with, you know, it's like a tanker truck with a bunch of chemicals in it. God knows what's in there. And they, uh, they hose down your lawn and they have usually some 18 year old kid who doesn't have a clue what he's doing. Um, you know, do the work and cut the, cut the lawn with a big, you know, mower or whatever. <clears throat> and you could, you could get that. <clears throat> the problem is, is that those big companies, because they have thousands of customers in, in your city or whatever, they don't really care if you are not satisfied with everything they've done. You know, they sort of offer a price. Here's, here's the price for this service. We do the service. And for most people, it's adequate, right? But if you, you're not entirely happy, they just don't really care, right? So you could tell your 10-year-old son or whatever, it says, you know, you want to make some bucks? Okay, make like a flyer or something. Put it in the mailbox of every house on the street and say like, look, I'm this person, I live at that house, you know, <clears throat> and, uh, if you want someone that can cut your grass on time and do a great job, hire me, you know, and maybe I'm not necessarily cheaper than the big company, but I care more because I only have, I would only have a maximum of like 30 customers. So I care if people are not happy and they don't want to engage me again. Okay. Also, I have the advantage of being local. You guys know me. And if you have a complaint, you could just march up to my house and bang on the door and complain, right? So it's a little bit more of a personal touch, right? Now, a lot of people, a lot of customers, all things being equal, if it's the same price for the same service, they'd probably hire the local person because 
they feel that they would get more attention. Okay. They matter more to the business. So once again, that's the focus strategy. I'm going to only work with you guys on this street. Okay. I'm going to provide a personalized service for your particular needs. I'm not trying to satisfy everybody in the city, just you guys. So that's a focus strategy. And I'm going to cater to you and try and satisfy you more than any big competitor would. Okay. Who doesn't care about you? You're, you're nothing to them in the grand scheme of things, things. So there you go. So that's the focus strategy. So that tends to be a winner for people, excuse me, who are doing a side hustle or trying to start their own little business or even entrepreneurs trying to do a bit more of an innovative startup. That tends to be an easy way in. Okay. You could provide the same product that somebody else is doing essentially, or the same service. Okay. But because you have a lot less customers and because, you know, you're, you're local or, you know, you have more individualized touch, you win. God, you win out, excuse me. So there you go. So those are the three most common basic strategies that everybody talks about. I don't feel that they really do a good job. They talk about it in the sense of imagine you're like the biggest company in the world. They talk about it in those terms. It's like, yeah, how often does that happen? So there you go. Um, yeah. And I want to re- reiterate the cost leadership thing where basically you try and reduce your costs so you can put your prices as low as possible. That tends to not work for small businesses. Okay. Uh, because you're small and you, you'll never be able to get your prices down that low. That's what I don't hear a lot of people saying, but it's true. And as, as everything in this podcast, don't take my word on it. I encourage everyone to do independent research to confirm anything you hear here or any idea you have. Confirm it. Don't just take the advice of some random person and bet your life savings on it. That's, that's not a key to success. Trust me. Um, <clears throat> and oh, I'm going off my notes or I actually wrote some notes this time. So it was a bit more structured. But uh, I want to say this, the goal for all businesses and founders, I love this quote, okay, this is someone that, uh, that sort of mentored me a little bit in a past life, said you want to take your existing IP, intellectual property, and reapply it to high growth markets. That's a very fancy way of saying, take what you have, what you can do, and turn it into a product or service that will sell, okay? And that applies to anybody that's thinking of starting their side hustle or their own business. Take what you have. Okay? If, you're, if you have some capabilities, you have some talents, right? And try and package it, <clears throat> excuse me, package it into something that you can sell. That's the real challenge, okay? A lot of people, uh, they, the first problem they have is the idea, right? What should I do? And I see people agonizing over this and they take years to decide what it is and they can't figure it out. Well, it's very easy to figure out what your idea should be. Start with what you can do. Okay. What you're passionate about, what you have talent for, what you have skills in. Okay. Take that and then think, okay, how can I turn that into something that will sell? Okay. Now you're not going to be able to conclusively come up with an answer. You can come up with possible answers, but then what you do is you validate those by trying it. And we're going to talk about that later in the podcast. Okay. A few things that I want to cover that I know a lot of people uh, are, are kind of thinking about and worrying about is, uh, incubators, accelerators, and partners. Now in your hometown, they might have resources for people who are wanting to start their own companies. And if you're wanting to do more of a tech startup or more of an innovative type startup of some kind, uh, they may have something called an accelerator or something called an incubator. Okay. Usually what these are, are it's like a little group. It's like a little company. Sometimes they're funded by the government, depending what country you're in. Um, and their goal is to try and encourage people to start companies that succeed. Okay. That's their goal. And 
the lingo is that if, if they're trying to get people to think up ideas and start a company, that's technically an incubator. And if they're instead, they're trying to provide resources for startup companies that are just sort of getting their feet. They're already, they're already running, but they're just trying to find their feet. That's technically called an accelerator. Okay. The lingo varies, but you have these and you might be wondering, should I join these? Okay. Now I'm not going to tell you a yes or no. Okay. But what I'm going to share with you is I'm going to share you, I'm going to share with you my own experience because I have worked inside, uh, two of those before, and I'm going to sort of give you my experiences. You can take it or leave it and the impressions I've gotten. Um, <clears throat> okay. So for a few years, I mentored startup founders and, uh, yeah, basically startup founders didn't do any small businesses, just startup founders uh, through an, uh, technically it was an incubator. They called themselves an accelerator, but they're really an incubator. And <clears throat> it was not a great experience. I mean, I, I had a great experience meeting with a lot of entrepreneurs and would be entrepreneurs and doing lots and lots of coaching and mentoring and that kind of stuff. You know, uh, they sort of paid me by the hour to, to basically, it's almost like a therapy session, really to coach people. The, the founders would come in say once a week or once every two weeks, and they'd have like a, you know, two or four hour meeting with me. And, you know, it was basically, we'd cover everything under the sun. What's going on? What should be the next move? What, you know, what problems we're having and how we can best overcome them, things like this. And it involved people that were at all stages. So people that didn't really know what they wanted to do all the way to people that had started. They had gotten the financing together. They were starting their operations, but they were running into issues and they needed some assistance. So all of that. And <clears throat> my experiences were dealing with the startup founders was good, but dealing with the organization was not great because my impression was that uh, the people that were in charge of these ventures they really didn't know what they were doing. And that's been my experience. You have a lot of incapable people running these. Now, what they provided was they provided sort of a, um, a network of people. So you could sort of join this and they would connect you with other entrepreneurs. They would connect you with some business resources. Okay. And they would connect you to some sources of financing. Now, Here's my problem with it. Why does somebody want to be an entrepreneur? Usually it's because they're not following a crowd. They're thinking independently, you know, rather than doing the default thing, like getting a job, these people want to do something beyond. They want to go further. They want to do something beyond the standard thing. They want to take a risk. They want to jump into something that could be awesome. Okay. It's a little bit risky, a little bit uncertain, right? In my experience, those are not really the type of people that are very, um, how shall we say, social, extrovert. They need the approval of others to do things. They don't really know what they want to do until they hear 30 other opinions, and then they sort of pick one. Now... That's just my take on it. There are all kinds of people in this world. Some people are into that and that's great. Uh, what they used, would do is they'd get these people all together. They would do a variety of team building exercises, which I'm sure we all love, you know, uh, events where you have to think of business ideas and, you know, you tell each other your business ideas, or you've got one minute to come up with a business idea and pitch it to somebody else. You know, it's like... You know, it's, it's, it's an interesting exercise, but is it really useful in cre in creating wealth? No, not in my experience. N none of that stuff really is. Okay. If you have no clue what you're doing, the way I think, and what's worked for me is the first thing you do is you get educated. You don't sort of fumble around in this amateur world of other people that also don't know how to make it. You learn <laughs> how, how it's done. Right. And there's two ways of learning. One is like through education, you learn business properly. 
not with a coffee table book, but you actually learn it properly. And then number two, you try things. You know, you learn through experience. Because in the world of entrepreneurship, it's no coincidence that experience is regarded very, very highly. And the last time I did one of these um, live streams on this topic, somebody commented and sort of gave me an argument and said, like, you know, well, the purpose of learning is so that we learn from other people's mistakes. Why should we go out and learn everything the hard way? You know, that's stupid. We should learn everything from books and, you know, like other people's experience condensed and we get the benefit from it. And I agree. I agree. That's the whole point of universities and learning and formal education. That's why, in fact, I believe that learning business is a great thing because you're learning from the, the masters, the greats who figured this stuff out. You don't have to figure it out from scratch. They figured it all out, right? They figured out all the principles and then they condensed them down into some knowledge and you learn the knowledge and then you don't have to learn any of that the hard way. Okay? So great, great. The problem is, is that when it comes to this stuff, you're taking a step into the unknown, okay? The people who mastered business and wrote it down for the rest of us, they don't know what the world needs right now with the state of technology, with the state of, you know, the social climate, with consumer attitudes in any niche in industry you can imagine. They, they don't know that. How would they know in 1970? How would they know in 2020 what someone needs now in 2022 when I'm giving this? They don't. In your city, in your location, to that specific niche market that you're trying to target, Obviously, you won't be able to find information on that. That's unknown. And moreover, you're trying to do this by yourself. You have a particular set of skills, talents, and flaws, likes and dislikes. You like doing this type of work, but you don't like doing this type of work. You're good at this particular activity, but you're not so good at this, right? So what you should do you're not going to get from a book because it doesn't take any of that into account. Okay. So it's this balancing act. You learn business, but then you got to go out and try stuff yourself. Okay. Now, when I say this, remember, I'm saying you try things that basically cost no money. I'm not talking about taking big financial risk. You should not take big financial risk until you know what you're doing and until you've proven you've validated something. Okay. So <clears throat> that's all I'll say about that. So anyway, we were talking about incubators and accelerators. I think maybe there's a place for them, but I don't think they're the be all end all that they think they are. And they're far less useful than they think they are. Okay. If you're trying to start a business like you're in Silicon Valley, I would say go to Silicon Valley. Okay. Because if you're not in Silicon Valley or anywhere like it, you're just out in some other place. Don't try and start a business like you're in Silicon Valley. It won't work because you're not in Silicon Valley. The financiers are not where you are. The talent is not where you are. Uh, all the resources are not where you are. So it's not going to be as successful. And a lot of these places, at least in my experience, they sort of model themselves on like, you know, if you were in Silicon Valley, this is what you should do. Right. And they try and proceed like that. And it usually does not work. In fact, I don't know of any major, major successes that have really worked like that. So, yeah. Entrepreneurship is not this different thing from business, it's a part of business. Okay. Um, you know, and one thing else I want to say, um, a lot of people also don't know this, and that is that if you're trying to do an innovative tech startup, if that's what you've chosen, that's fine, but be aware that you have undertaken the hardest business challenge there is, okay? It's far easier to establish a non-innovative, traditional business, like say you want to be a plumber or something, you open a plumbing company, you know? I always use that example of a plumber, but you know, 
anything. You want to open a bakery, you know, so, something traditional. It's actually far easier to do that than it is to start a tech startup, something innovative, okay? Because think about this, and I have said this before and I will say it again. Let's say you're a plumber, okay, or you're a bakery. You sell bread, pastry, you know, whatever they make in a bakery, cakes, uh, muffins, all that kind of stuff. Well, when I tell you this, you guys already know what that product is, right? You know what a cake is, you know what bread is, you know what a muffin is right? If I'm starting an innovative tech startup and I'm doing a new app or I'm doing a new technology and I tell you what it is, you'll be like, okay, you know, your eyes glaze over because it goes over your head. You don't know what that is. You know, do I need that? I, I don't think I need that. Uh, what, what good would that do? Right? So already, you know, you can see it's a tougher sell, right? If you're in a tech startup, you kind of, there's this pressure to like educate the public now, you know, I have to educate you about what our product does because just telling you the name of it, you will have no clue what it is. You will have no clue what it does and you will have absolutely no clue why you need it or why you should pay for it. You know, what's it going to solve for you? You can't see this without me explaining it to you. That's already a considerable hurdle right off the bat. As opposed to putting up a sign, uh, you know, on a street near a construction site that says, you know, Bill's Plumbing, you know, 24-hour service, um, you know, industry standard rates, you know, this kind of thing. And then the construction business who are in the business of building houses and buildings they go oh cool another plumber okay so if if i need a plumber in a pinch i'll just call them there's a phone number they already know what plumbing is they already need a plumber they already know exactly what they're getting into and they know why they should pay for it right there just by saying what what you do and who you are already all those questions are answered right so that's an advantage over a typical type business a traditional business than an innovative startup okay um, and in addition, a tech innovative startup, usually you've got a lot of expensive operations, whether it's R and D or, you know, whatever it is. So you got these huge costs up front that you don't have in say a plumbing company. What does it cost to start operating tomorrow as a plumber? Well, I need a, maybe a vehicle. I need a phone. I need a set of tools. And that's it. I can rent the vehicle. I can rent the tools. And, you know, a phone doesn't cost much. So, you know, for, I don't know, under $1,000, I could be up and running tomorrow as a plumber, if, if you know what you're doing, <laughs> right? Uh, but if you're trying to invent, f you know, workable fusion power technology, uh, no, no, you can't be up and running by tomorrow. And in order to get up and running, you're going to need lots of money up front, and there's a huge chance that it may not even, if you do get that money, it may not even produce a product. So, right? So you're undertaking one of the biggest business challenges of all time if you do a tech startup. Okay, I'm not trying to dissuade people from it. I'm just saying that that's what that game is. Okay? Um, so, you know, unless you're positioned where you have some kind of advantage it makes sense for you to do that you already have the technology or you know you already have a friend that's willing to loan you five million dollars you know uh okay great then maybe it makes sense right but for all other people that's usually not the way to think okay so uh that's what i wanted to say that the extreme challenge of an innovative business Oh, I'm doing pretty good for a sick guy. I, uh, I see there's 25 people here. Thank you for being here. You guys are awesome. You need to be a member to, uh, post a question in the chat, or I suppose you could do a super chat. Um, but everyone can see this. So that's great. Incidentally, if you are a member of my channel, you get a bunch of stuff. You get members only videos, you get participation in this kind of thing. Um, so there you go. And a shout out to all my Patreons and channel members. You guys are awesome. I appreciate all the support.
Okay. I want to back up a little and talk about something that somebody requested I talk about, which was, you know, how do you improve yourself so that, you know, it will serve you well in either a career or in what we're talking about here, your own career, okay? Uh, working as an employee or working in this business here. Okay, what are some life skills? Um, I guess the starting point for my answer is to say, look, uh, if you haven't already done so, try and get your hands on a copy of that famous business book called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Um, it's an absolute classic book. It's a very easy read. And uh, just read it, okay? That'll provide you with sort of the first step, in my opinion, of you know, how to deal with people and all this kind of stuff. Okay, so, so do that first. That would be my first uh, recommendation, okay? Basically, that teaches you the right attitude and a lot of protocol, okay? Protocol, how to behave when you communicate with people, when you meet people under different circumstances, okay? When you interact with people in, in different situations, that'll teach you that stuff, okay? Um, then beyond that book, then try and learn protocol, okay? Like I just said, how to interact with people. That book gives you a start on it, but there's a lot more practical skills, like how you approach people. Um, if you wanted to contact a company and say, you know, I'd like to partner with you, or maybe we could work together, or could I talk to you about something? That's a very important skill, okay? So work on that. Um, you can learn that from a variety of sources. The most basic thing to do is to watch what executives and things do, how they talk to each other, how they behave, things like this. That, that can be a good starting point. Um, I do cover it a little bit in my, actually my, my Get Hired course. That's where I talk about getting a job through networking and things like that. It's a very simple concept to reaching out to a company for other reasons right? That's, that's how I built my business. I was reaching out to a lot of CEOs of companies and, you know, getting meetings with them and, you know, having informational interviews with them and having a rapport with them and all this kind of stuff. And a lot of them became my customers for my consulting business. So that's kind of, you know, where those skills sort of come in. Okay. It's not the most advanced stuff in the world, but it's something that anybody can really learn if you're open to it, if you consider it a value, uh, it's something to, to do. And, and if it doesn't come naturally, a little bit of practice certainly helps. You learn by doing, okay? So how to approach or communicate people based on the situation. And then the third thing I would do is learn marketing, okay? Marketing is extremely important, especially if you're doing what we're talking about here, which is going into business for yourself. It's the single most important thing you need to know, okay? That's basically to find out who your customers would be, okay, where they are, right, how you contact them, how you, you connect with those people, like how you find them and, you know, how you reach them, and then what you should say to them to get them to do business with you, right? Like that's what, all of that, that's marketing, okay? So that's extremely important for wanting to do this. So once again, marketing is really not that hard of a topic. If you've done technical things in school, like let's say you've done high school mathematics, okay, you can certainly wrap your head around university level marketing. There's no math, really. Um, it's quite straightforward. It just, it just the people don't usually think in those terms. You know, whether you're a technical introvert type person or you're an extroverted sales type person, we don't think like like this by default. So learning it can really open your mind to, you know, how you uh, communicate. It's basically the scientific study of how to make something popular. Okay. So that has, as you can appreciate, tremendous applications, right? If you're doing something and you want it to be popular, that's usually how success uh, arrives, right? By something being popular. Marketing is the way to go. Um, there's a lot of people that start YouTube channels. I've noticed that, you know, they, they don't understand marketing clearly, you know, they'll do these videos that are kind of all about them. And, you know, and you're asking questions like, well, who is this for? 
And why should they care about this? And, you know, what are they getting out of it? And the answer is kind of like nothing. You know, it's, it's very self-indulgent. It might be fun for you to do, but, and, and, and if that's all your, your only goal, okay, fair enough. But if you're trying to make it popular, if you're trying to make some kind of viral video or something, that's not the way to go. Marketing will teach you all that. <clears throat> And finally, um, I want to talk about something else some, that somebody requested, um, which are, uh, how can I introduce this? It's a fact, it's called, it's, it's a very dry title. It's actually pretty cool, but it's, it sounds so dry. Factors that affect profitability. Okay. So if you want to do something, what are the things that's going to lead to profitability? Notice I'm not using the word success because success is kind of wishy-washy. It can mean anything you want it to mean. Well, nobody bought our thing, but it was a success because we achieved a goal of making this product. No one has ever made that product before. Nobody bought it, but it's there. <clears throat> you know, we proved to the world it could be done. We proved to ourselves that we could do it. Okay. You see, it's th uh, you could define that as success, right? But I'm talking about something very specific profitability. You're doing this and one of your goals is going to be to make money. That's what this is about. You're going to be replacing an income. You don't have to work as an employee. So whatever you do, it has to make money and it has to do it under certain circumstances. Like you don't need to spend a million dollars for you to start making money, right? You have to be able to do it in, in practical terms. Okay. So what are the factors? <clears throat> The first factor is something I covered last time, quality. Whatever you do, do it well. Because success follows quality. That's probably one of the most fundamental, important business lessons I've ever learned. Okay? Let's tie it to an example everybody knows, right? YouTube. Um, I did some videos a long time ago. Uh... I don't know if they went viral, but they've got millions of views, okay? How did I do that? I did that by focusing on making the best possible video I could do at the time. I'm not a video maker. I don't come from that world. <clears throat> you have to excuse me if I go into a coughing fit. Oh, I'm still sick. Okay, and I tried to make the most compact best video I could. When I look back at them, they're still kind of amateur, but um, they ended up getting millions of views. In contrast to that, I've done a lot of videos, kind of like this one, where it's just me sort of talking off the top of my head. It's not scripted. It's not, um, it's not really, I haven't really focused a lot of time and effort on them. It's just sort of, you know, you kind of go live and Whatever you say, you say, right? Now, as you can imagine, you probably don't get the world's most amazing speech under those conditions, right? Um, and also, the video is not very exciting visually, right? I don't have a lot of things going off in the background. I probably should. I'd like to get more color into this. But, um, so anyway, so the, you could regard this as like a sort of lower quality video. A lot less effort went into it than some of those videos I did at the beginning of my YouTube channel. Um, that, that I think one's got like nearly 5 million views, something like that. <clears throat> and those are my early videos. So, and, and not just that, it was a lot of thinking that went into it. It was like, okay, who is this for? Uh, what's the message I'm going to produce? It should be of value. And I have to sort of package it in a way that they're already looking for this. And, uh, you know, they're, they're doing a search and, if they're doing a search, they, they find my thing. And then when they find my thing and they start watching it, you have to like hit, you know, with a punch, you know, at the beginning to make them interested and make them, you know, all this kind of stuff. You're, you're sort of focusing on all these little requirements, right? Um, and really breaking it down. So you can work for like a week or two weeks on like a three minute video, right? As opposed to doing this where you could just produce two hour video off the cuff, right? So that's, Yet another example of that, you lead with quality. The other thing I say often is how many times have you seen 
a really, really great restaurant, like who had amazing food, not, not, not just good food, not like okay food, not, you know, not bad food, but absolutely amazing. You have to have it. How many times have you seen a restaurant that has that go out of business? I would wager not very often. Restaurants are another sort of very common business people like to start. I wouldn't be my first choice for a business because you got to, you got to spend a lot of money up front. It's a high initial capital outlay is the technical term. Um, <clears throat> but you have a lot of mediocre restaurants. The food is okay, right? It's not amazing. It's, you know, it's good, I guess, right? You have a lot of those going out of business, right? They don't last. But how many times have you seen like in a restaurant with absolutely amazing food go out of business? Not very often. Not very often. I wouldn't say it never happens, but, you know, it goes down dramatically, right? If you could come up with some amazing food, even if it's a little bit more expensive, that's fine. But amazing. Chances are good things will follow. Okay, that's, that's what this business rule says. I didn't create this rule. This has been well known. This was discovered in like the 1960s. They first started proving this with data in a very, very scientific way. Okay. So it's out there, you know, didn't come from me and don't take my word for it. Go and do your own research and confirm this. Okay. But that's the number one factor that leads to profitability. Okay. Because if you have amazing food, if you have an amazing product, first of all, you can charge premium prices for it, like a higher price and people will buy it because it's awesome. Right. Secondly, you could decide to lower your prices and provide something absolutely amazing which will mean that, you know, everybody will buy your, your, your product or service in large quantities, your, your volume goes up. So therefore at least the profitability that way. Um, it also helps push out your competitors because they're offering something mediocre for a low price. You're offering something amazing for a low price. Which one would you buy? Right? What a lot of people do is they charge premium prices. They say, okay, you know, if you want something mediocre, you go over to there to their business. But if you want the best, you come here, right? And uh, like, that's what a lot of premium brands do. And that's a very profitable business because you raise your prices, but nobody cares because if they want the best, they come to you and they're happy to pay premium prices because they love what you do. They absolutely love it and they're addicted, they will come back again and again and again, right? Because the thing that you do is so amazing, right? So that's what they found. So quality is number one. Um, you, could, you could have a quality strategy, and that's you know, something, I don't know if that's a thing, quality strategy, but uh, just a business principle. Remember that. Whatever you do, do it really well. Don't half-ass it. It's hard to make great things come by producing a product or service that's just half-assed. It's adequate. It's the basics, right? Now, a lot of people, they try and fool themselves into doing that. They say, okay, well, we're first going to do, you know, a proof of concept. We're going to do a version 1.0. We're going to do, um, you know, minimum viable product, MVP. They, they, they come up with all kinds of logical sounding thought process that will justify that. And sometimes it makes sense for very specific applications, but a lot of time it doesn't. A lot of times what you end up doing, what's, what, what the end result is, is that you've produced a kind of mediocre offering, right? You know, nobody cares that it's like a stepping stone to something else or, you know, whatever conception you have of it. Um, but you've just produced this thing that's not really that great. So it doesn't exactly set the world on fire. Okay, so whatever you do, do an amazing job at it. That's the key. What can you do that's amazing? Think about that. Okay, and that's a good place to start. So that's the number one thing, quality. Number two thing that affects profitability is market share. Okay, if you're a big fish in a small pond, you tend to be more successful. Okay, um, that means that if, if you're established and most people are already buying your product, you're much more efficient. You, you're, it's easy for you to be profitable than your competitor, okay? Doesn't matter what you're offering for what price, okay? If you've got this giant player 
that is offering their thing. Okay. And they, and they've captured the market. Most people already buy it from them. That gives them an advantage. Okay. Market share that that's something that we, that they've demonstrated through data is a, is a big thing. Doesn't really influence us that much other than it, it somewhat confirms the focus strategy and says like, you know, look, you cater to this little, little market. Okay. The third one is high investment. Okay. That means that businesses that take a lot of money to, to get going and to keep running, they're usually not as profitable. Okay. So for example, an oil refinery, right? I always use that example. It costs billions of dollars to, to build. You have to, you have to get billions in financing to build one of these things. And then, uh, it's like multiple years before you could create one. And then when it starts operating, yeah, it makes a lot of money. You're selling, you know, you're doing stuff with oil and gas, very profitable. But what we tend to see is that those are not as profitable as you think because you had to spend all that money to create them in the first place. So for a start, when you start making money, you're, the most obvious thing is that you're already having to pay off some of that money that you presumably borrowed to build the thing, right? Now, on the other extreme, take something like an HR company. You offer HR services, recruitment and selection or whatever. What do you need to do that company? Well, you need a phone and a computer and maybe an office. And that's it. But I mean, you don't really need the office. You need a phone and a computer. You could do it from your car, you know? Uh, zero amount of money to set that up, okay? Now, if you're projections of financing were the same for the oil refinery and for the HR company. I mean, they're silly examples. You can't really compare them, but, but if they were, okay, you're going to make this much revenue in the first year or whatever. Obviously the HR company would be much more profitable in the long run because you don't have that initial capital outlay. Okay. Now, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because we have access to the internet and the internet is an incredible resource. You can, co you can connect with millions of people from your phone or from your desktop computer, whatever you're using, your tablet. Absolutely unheard of before the internet came around, right? You can get your message out to millions of people, potentially, if you know what you're doing, okay? Look at YouTube. It doesn't cost anything to join YouTube. You could make a viral video, bam, millions of people see it. Okay, I've done that. Um, so it is possible, right? I mean, you got to... It's not necessarily easy. It's not like it requires no effort whatsoever. But, you know, if you know what you're doing, okay, for very little money, zero, basically, you can do it. Okay, so, so it's absolutely incredible. You have the ability to contact many, many people and make them aware of what you're doing. And if what you're doing resonates with them, you could get a response, right? Okay. So that's, um, that's something amazing about this thing. It requires no capital outlay and you can contact millions of people. Put those two facts together and hopefully that gives you some ideas. Okay. Now, if, if someone asked me for advice, I would say like, okay, look, if this is something you want to do, you want to have your own business someday. Okay. Maybe start now. Okay. Start with those two facts. The internet allows you to contact potentially millions of people and um, you can get them to respond. You can buy things online. They can click on something and earn you money, you know, whatever. Okay. Incredible potential there. It requires no money down to be able to do this. It just requires a little know-how. So maybe what you should do as much as you can is start now and try and learn, learn the basics of marketing, learn how you can do this online. You know, maybe your, so, your favorite social networking site, you know, maybe they have groups or hashtags or, you know, whatever tools out there that you can use to reach lots and lots of people that might be interested in the thing that you're doing, right? And see if you can reach them, see if you can say something to them that will resonate and get them to respond. And that will validate a lot of ideas.
Okay. So incredible tool. And this is something that anybody can do. If you have the ambition to do this, start figuring this out, start like learning some of you know, the basics of marketing. If you don't know it already, learn a little bit of business and uh, start using these tools and then start thinking like, what can I do? What talents do I have? What um, traits do I have? What can I contribute that, you know, could be turned into something that someone would buy in some way, shape or form that could generate revenue in some way, right? <clears throat> okay, the, the, the final thing I'll say is uh, factors that affect profitability. We talked about three, right? Quality, market share, and high investment. Okay, the fourth one is cash flows. If you have a lot of money flowing, a lot of money coming in, a lot of money coming out, all things being equal, that tends to make you more profitable than an operation that has less cash flow. You know, so if you're building houses, you're building houses for a living, I don't know. You know, you sell the house up front and then you build it or you build the house and then it's fully built and it might take a year or something and then you sell it. Well, you don't have a lot of money coming in for a year, okay? So you don't have, you don't have very positive cash flow. So that would be a strike against that business model, okay? What you want is you want money flowing immediately, as soon as possible, flowing in. And some's going some's gonna to flow in and flow out because you'll have expenses, but getting stuff flowing in as fast as possible and as much as possible, that leads to, that. all things being equal, that leads to greater profitability, okay? There are some business models where you don't have a lot of money flowing. For example, 20 years ago, they had the, uh, what do they call it? The tech bubble, right? Google was a part of that, by the way. It was one of the few companies that, that sort of survived, that started in that little tech bubble. Um, but you had a lot of these companies and their business model was, we're going to like bulk up really big because the first person to get into a market is going to, you know, winner takes all. They're going to, the first person to get there is going to be the winner. So they borrowed all kinds of money. They, they built buildings. They hired hundreds or thousands of employees and just bulk up really fast. All before they had any money coming in because they had no product. They had to then build a product, you know, and then just hope that it would sell. Well, it didn't work. Most of them, they spent millions upon millions upon millions of borrowed money. <clears throat> a lot of it was borrowed. Some of it was invested. And they either couldn't build it or the ones that could, they found that nobody wanted it. And the whole thing collapsed and it was a bubble. Just poof. All these companies disappeared overnight. Everybody lost their money and the economy took a hit. The world economy took a hit. You know, so that was that. And at the time, there was a lot of arrogance. They were saying, you know, no, we, we, we've rewritten the rules of business. <clears throat> you don't need cash. You don't need positive cash flow. This is a whole new world. It's the internet. Everything is new and different, you know, and a lot of more experienced business people were saying, uh, I don't know about that. You, you're like sort of rewriting the fundamental rules. That usually doesn't work. And it didn't because it was crap. And, uh, it was just a fad and a fad of false thinking, right? So that's where this one comes into play. So having money come in quickly, soon, right? Without you having to spend a lot. The more you can do that, the more it will result, blah, 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 blah. The more it will result in long-term profitability, right? I'm always in favor of somebody going with a plan where Cash comes in as soon as possible, okay? Rather than having these grandiose plans that, you know, there's like multiple stages of this big plan you're going to do. And then, and then at the 10th step or the 10th stage, that's when money first starts to come in. No, no. Strip it down. Make it as basic as possible to get money to come in as soon as possible. That's what usually leads to great things. And then you build. But you build with money coming in, 
So it funds itself. You might even make a profit too at the same time if you know what you're doing. So these are principles. So those are the four relevant uh, things that lead to profitability in order. Okay. The number one thing is quality. Number two thing is market share. Number three thing is high investment. So um, how much money does it cost to get the business up and running? And then the fourth one is cash flows, you know, having strong cash flows, having money coming in soon. is what else. The fifth one, we're not really going to talk about that. That was uh, vertical integration. Okay. We're not really going to talk about it. It's not really relevant to this, but um, there you go. So there's some business principles that hopefully will help you um, or at least give you some direction to do this. If you want to do your own business, <clears throat> you know, what's a great thing that I recommend is while you're working as an employee, okay, be learning, be investing in yourself, learn business, learn marketing, marketing. It's the all important thing. Okay. Then be trying things, trying things, get on LinkedIn, get on Facebook, get on Instagram, get on, you know, all the, you know, all the stuff, right? You don't have to do all of them, but I mean, pick, pick one or two things that you're more familiar with and try reaching out to people like joining groups or connecting with people that might be in, the, in that niche market. They, they might be interested in the thing you're doing. Okay. And then see if you can get them interested in something, do, do a post, do a message, do a, you know, whatever tweet, you know, wh whatever. And see if you can get a lot of coverage, a lot of exposure, and then a lot of responses, you know, because you'll be learning, you'll be learning not only the basics of how to do this, but you'll be learning about that, that niche market there. Okay. Like what, how they think, what's important to them, what they want, right? That kind of stuff. And that's what is going to be a source of value for you later on. If you knew exactly how customers think this would be easy. If you knew exactly where they were and exactly what to say to them, making money would be no problem at all. You know, oh, okay, all they want is this. Nobody provides that really the way they want. All I have to do is do that, and then I'll make millions of dollars because everybody wants it, and I know exactly how to pitch it to them, and I know exactly how to do it so they all hear it. This would be easy, right? This wouldn't really be a challenge. So it's learning that information that's the key to success. Okay, so that's what I recommend people do. It's not something that's overnight success. Everybody wants like some quick payoff. Like, what was that book that somebody wrote? Like, The Automatic Millionaire? I, I don't know who wrote that. I don't even know what it was about. But it's like, I don't like those kind of titles, you know? Oh, I just do this quick and easy thing, and I sit back, and the money will roll in. It's like, no, no, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You have to know more than everybody else. You have to know what to do. Nobody knows your niche market. I keep saying it differently. Niche market, like you because you put in the time to try all this stuff and validate it. Anyway, hopefully you found that interesting. If you want to go deeper, uh, I created that $100 MBA course, okay, for precisely people who want to do this. If you want to learn business, you don't want to break the bank to do it, okay? You learn everything that you would in a master's level business degree, Okay, you get all the textbooks that they use in universities and the best universities in the world and places like Harvard. Okay, you get the same material. Now, nobody's going to read the book to you. It's a self-study thing. You get the book. You could skim it. You could ignore it. You could read it all the way through. You could really study it. It's up to you. Okay, there's no tests, no evaluations, no exams, no assignments. Right. It's all up to you how deep you want to go. But the knowledge is there. I'm providing you with the knowledge. It doesn't come from me. It comes from the foremost experts in the world whose material is taught in university. So you're going right to the source for this stuff. And it almost doesn't matter because business is really not that hard. It really isn't. The fundamentals of business, it's not this magical, you know, what's the word, intangible thing that everybody seems to treat it as. No, it's, it's a skill like any other. It's, it's an area of study like any other. The basics are pretty simple. When you get into this like really, really advanced, you know, complex things that only apply in, 
very specific situations to very big companies, then it gets very complex. Yes. But you don't need to know that stuff. You need to know the basics and need to focus on the basics. So if you're interested in that, there is a link in the description for a hundred bucks. You get that and you're on your way. It might take you a year to go all the way through it. It might, you could do it in a lot less if you want to skim it. But as I say, the, probably the most important is the, the marketing part of that. Okay. You get a textbook on marketing, uh, one of the top textbooks in the world on it. That's taught in many, many universities all around the world, uh, for many years. And you get that and that'll teach you the fundamentals and you can go as deep into that as you want. So if that's of any interest to you, check out the link in the description. I've even provided a link to a video where I do a Q and a on the course itself. So how it works, exactly what you get. Um, and that kind of thing. So, um, that's a resource. Uh, if you are interested, I created it with this express purpose. And, um, if you are interested in pursuing that in a carefully controlled way where you limit your risk, but you, what's the word you give yourself a chance for greatness, something beyond just being an employee, you get to be your own person. You get to do what you want and you get to use these skills to make you money in the way that you want. If that's of any interest to you and you don't know where to get started, I would start with that and go watch the uh, previous three uh, installments of this uh, podcast. So thank you very much. There's 21 people here. You guys are all awesome. I hope to see you again on the next episode of Beyond Employment. Take care of yourselves.